that was in trouble. I walked in from Arizona this morning. Um, so I want to uh, thank uh, uh, the many faculty members who are hosting me here, including Julie, who ran and got me. I, I walked uh, halfway here. Uh, but um, she's parking now. And this is what a great uh, set of uh, faculty members and students you have on this campus and the many food groups, not only that students have initiated, but the ones in the community. I'd like to uh, talk about uh, some good news in the world as we're approaching the election and the headlines today was 51% of the Americans expect violence uh, election week. Um, I'm thinking, how many of you feel like we need a little good news now and then? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm wondering when Bayer Crop Science uh, merges with uh, with Monsanto, if the government lets them do that, whether they're going to be given us aspirins with Roundups or antidepressants in them. But, but the point is, uh, the good news is part of what we see in the local food movement and the heirloom seed saving movement. And I just want to tell you that story and the role that ethnobiologists like Virginia Nazarene and her students who started the Southern Seed Legacy and, and Julie worked with her work in Panama and many other people have been doing in this uh, community. I had breakfast today with Tom Leonard of the um, Independent Baking Company and he's one of my heroes. He really began the heritage grain and artisanal baking movement in this country. So you have national heroes here in your own midst. So I call this conservation you can taste because uh, I think something we were talking about last night with others at the table that um, some people in the country want a conservation movement to not just appeal to our heads but to our hearts and to our sensory uh, uh, apparatuses that, that we really are one of the few countries who reward people for their efforts in conservation by saying, enjoy this, not just the wonder of nature, but all the food and, and uh, bird songs and, and uh, color that comes with doing conservation right. So this is a story about that. And if we needed another reason to take better care of biodiversity, and particularly food biodiversity, Hi, Julie. Hey, Gary. Good morning. Haven't I seen you someplace recently? <laughs> I think so. In a parking lot or no? Uh, if we need another reason for better taking care of this food diversity, climate change is not something that we're going to face in the future. It's already here. And it gives us another reason to mobilize our neighbors to collaborate, not just to save species, like save the panda or, or, or uh, save the holler monkey or, or save the condor, but conserving relationships between um, plants, animals, and, and their cultural stewards. And many of these people that you'll see featured in the next few images are people that are still part of place-based cultures, whether you call them indigenous or Native American or traditional people that can't really identify their indigenous background, whether they're white, black, brown, yellow, or, or uh, neon green. I'm, I'm from Mars, I think. Um, uh, the, the point is that place-based cultures really uh, have taken care of this stuff all along. And there's a revival of that among their youth and among uh, their people. So we need a dialogue between these place-based cultures and those of us in academia and in conservation organizations and in sustainable ag organizations. I live in a place that's just become the uh, first city of gastronomy or city of food cultures uh, designated by the United Nations. Um, so we're part of something called the Creative Cities Network. And the UNESCO part of the United Nations that deals with cultural heritage thought that we merited that not only because we're a place where there's 4,100 years of continuous agriculture in our, our valley, uh, going back to archaeological finds of corn uh, about a half mile from where my office sits on the hill where this uh, black and white drawing was taken from, looking down over prehistoric terraces and floodplain fields. But there's a lot of innovation in our community around food, just like there is in your, your uh, 
community, and I celebrate. I learn so much when I come to Athens because the collaborations between farmers on the outside of town and, and restaurants and microbreweries. It's okay not only to eat local food, but to drink local brew. And I think you guys have some good opportunities to do that here. But even in a place where we've had successful desert agriculture for 4,100 years, um, climate change is affecting the sustainability, food security, and health status of the players in our food system. But we don't need one more uh, story of gloom and doom that's, that is sort of like uh, a rehash of the biblical story of the fall from the Garden of Eden, like everything that humans do on this planet screws it up even more. And I think there's a lot of counter evidence that the same power, the same capacity that humans have to degrade and deplete landscapes also demonstrates that we have the power to restore them. We can restore landscapes. Uh, and uh, a guy that was here for 20 years, Ron Pulliam, uh, who lives in our community, um, in the last six years, we, uh, with Ron, we've started uh, our Ecological Restoration Leadership Institute, a, uh, a for-profit nursery and restoration company that works on ranches, helping ranchers uh, get government contracts to put native plants and out in the landscape and heal damaged uh, gullies and watercourses. And we have uh, um, uh, nurseries, fish hatcheries, and several other businesses that have spun out of this. So what we hear on the media, like Fox News or any other news channel you want to mention, is about this fall from Eden and don't offer us much hope or help, but there are many things going on in the world that I hope you all be part of it. We often hear that global food crop diversity has been declining, and it has been. Uh, this uh, uh, drawing uh, shows uh, the number of uh, crop varieties around 1903 that were available in the United States for common vegetables. And these were available in the marketplace, not just in seed banks. People were growing these things for muskmelons, lettuce, sweet corn, cabbage, beets, tomatoes, cucumbers, etc. And those thick lines at the top is how many varieties were available a century ago, 400 to 5 varieties, most of those things. 80 years later, we were down to 17 or 28 or 12 of those, so about uh, 5 to 10 percent of the varieties that farmers grew everywhere in the U.S. and their different regions are now down just to just a shadow of that. And we know that the same thing is happening globally. A former student of mine, Colin Curry, wrote an incredible paper mm -hmm. two years ago that says, now more than at any point in human history, because of the homogenization of our agriculture, we have homogenized diets. So the people in Alaska and Australia and China and Afghanistan and Chad, Chile and Alabama are eating diets that are more similar to one another because of Walmart being in every one of those places and, and commodified food being moved around by ships. Um, that that we've lost the distinctiveness of uh, national and regional diets all over the planet. And so what you all eat each day in the cafeterias here may be entirely unrecognizable to the people who lived here 150 years ago. And it's more like what people eat in New England now or on the California coast. And Colin says that there's major global consequences for both food nutrition and food security of that. Uh, one size fits all diet because there's an enormous genetic variation within the human species. Even in this room, we have the blessing of people coming from different cultures and races and, and, uh, and uh, ethnic backgrounds. And, and the point is that, that that's an asset, not, not a, a uh, confounding factor. But the hidden story that doesn't get told as much as that one is that over the last uh, 40 years in North America, we've had a grassroots movement to bring back diversity to farms and tables that's unlike anything we've seen in any other industrial country. And there's been a fourfold increase in the uh, availability of uh, 
crop varieties of vegetables and grains and herbs and uh, fruits and nuts uh, on the uh, four and a half acres that I farm. We have 150 fruit varieties, um, most of them from, from historic sources, the Spanish mission fruits that came in with uh, uh, three centuries ago. We've gone out to springs and old uh, Catholic missions in northern Mexico and Arizona, New Mexico, and found these things still growing and brought them back and propagated them. And down below my house is a 60-acre seed farm that I helped farm, uh, farm 30 years ago that grows out 2,000 accessions of desert-adapted heirloom seeds on a 10-year rotation cycle. So at any point in time, when I look down over uh, the farm from the ridge where my orchards are, I see about 200 different kinds of vegetables being grown. And when I die, they're just going to roll me downhill and compost me so that I still contribute to the agricultural productivity down there, probably more than I am doing now. So the point is that that these are not just things that are available as archival curiosity pieces in seed catalogs and nurseries, that since this grassroots movement started among American gardeners and farmers and seed savers, um, we've seen first thousands and tens of thousands of farmers switch to these. And some of them are making their entire livelihoods off this diversity of crops providing them to restaurants and through farmers markets in a way that wasn't even possible 30 years ago, 20 years ago. And um, in some cases, 50 to 60 livestock growers are, are taking care and producing a breed of sheep or turkeys that um, was down to three or 400 animals in the whole world in the 1960s. And now there's tens of thousands of them and they're on the plates of your families every Thanksgiving day. And so it's not just that we save them, but they're in use, they're back on our tables, they're back in restaurants every day. And that's pretty remarkable because it increases the color and flavor and texture of our diets and the nutritional value, but it also helps the resilience of our farmlands. So in summary, since 1988, we've seen a number of seeds and breeds in our U.S. food system rise from about 5,000 to over 22,000. I mean, that's remarkable in such a short amount of time because that took thousands of years to, uh, of selection by farmers to diversify um, all those different crop species that originated in different continents and, and adapt them to particular places. And so even though eight crop species like rice and beans and corn and wheat and, uh, and uh, taro and, and uh, sweet potatoes and potatoes feed the world most of its calories, eight species, we have 640 species of food crops now grown on American soil. Each region has its own set. So even on this 18-day trip that I'm on, it's kind of a road tour of the great uh, uh, food cities and towns of the southeast, I see an entirely different set of things being grown in low country down around Charleston and up in the Appalachians near Boone and, and Asheville. And so a couple years ago, we made this goofy map uh, that I first um, did on a napkin with one of my students. <coughs> food regions of the United States and, um, and started naming them. Some of the names are sort of trivial, like no one in Appalachia calls themselves a member of uh, Chestnut Nation, because Chestnuts kind of went out a century ago. But tens of thousands of people have bumper stickers, uh, uh, t-shirts, caps, and even tattoos that say, I am a member of Salmon Nation in the Pacific Northwest. So in some places, this is really a rallying cry. In the, in the Great Plains, people call themselves part of uh, Bison Nation. And there's even a great song about Cornbread Nation by, uh, by uh, Tim O'Brien that uh, comes through here now and then. So the point is that, that we've now cataloged the diversity in each of these regions. And it's really distinctive sets of crops that have produced distinctive cuisines. But a lot of those are still endangered. And by endangered or rare, we say for endangered that they're in less than three nurseries 
for seed catalogs in the whole region. And for rare, we say they're in less than five. Now, that's not much. A lot of times with nurseries, a fruit tree is produced by one guy, and then he takes them to three or four different nurseries. So if that guy dies or his farms foreclosed upon, all those nurseries lose at once. We've lost 1,800 nurseries, independently owned nurseries in this country, which to me is important of having independently owned restaurants and, and coffee shops and microbreweries in our country rather than thinking that Sam Adams, Samuel Adams beer is actually a microbrew beer. Uh, the point is that 1,800 nurseries uh, took a dive when, when Home Depot and other places like that started to do garden centers. Ever talk to one of those guys at one of those garden centers and he asked, is this fruit tree adapted uh, to Georgia here? And you find the same damn fruit tree being sold from, from Maine to Florida to Southern California. Um, they don't even care whether it works here, they're just getting it on a truck and putting it out. And nurserymen knew what grew in their places these guys were basically, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, cash register um, service people, not nurserymen in those big box uh, garden centers. They're not selling you anything that will grow where you live. Well, again, I'm, I'm on this uh, uh, barnstorming tour to point out to academia the value of keeping great ethnobiology programs alive like the one you've had at UGA here for over 25 years. And ethnobiologists have played key roles in restoring this place-based diversity. Not merely, you know, to get tenure or to, to uh, have something to talk about in class, but as members of their community, so over and above their jobs, many of these people are growing these things in their front yards or renting a couple acres uh, to grow a rare corn or a rare uh, uh, root crop. And Nancy Turner um, and her colleagues in British Columbia have done this for years with berry plants and found that, that uh, Native Americans on the Pacific Northwest coast were moving around populations of wild apples and hybridizing them in the Pacific Northwest. And one of my students worked on the genetics of that stuff for her in a way that we never understood. And Nancy was the first ethnobiologist, well, the first person ever to re receive from Slow Food International Biodiversity Foundation in Italy, uh, the sort of uh, uh, Food Biodiversity Treasure Keeper Award, uh, Winona LeDuc from the uh, uh, White Earth Reservation in, in Minnesota has also received that. So they're the two North Americans who received that honor. But, but they've had a tremendous impact on the region, as has Kelly Kinger um, uh, bringing back heirloom crops and wild fruits of the tall grass prairie. And he used to live, uh, well, he, Tom Leonard, who runs uh, the independent baking company, used to live next to, to Kelly. And together they, they worked on bringing these from farm to table uh, in the University of Kansas area. Just came from Hawaii, where my daughter lives. and. Um, uh, got in on a thing called the Indigenous uh, Crop Biodiversity Festival before the international uh, conservation meetings of a group called IUCN. 10,000 people from 60 countries came in around the world. And native Hawaiians showed them the great range of foods that they brought back to Hawaii in part to uh, fight diabetes and penny. And Jerry here been growing these things and learning the differences between those varieties and how you can use them uh, for food preparation for three decades. And now they're teaching people 15 to 25 years old how to recognize 70 different kinds of uh, uh, taro or root crop by their smell and by their the, the colors in their stems and, and by the size of their roots. So this is happening in all of our 50 states. Food historians, ethnobotanists, and chefs are collaborating like at no point in history. Jim Dedito, uh, who graduated from here, is sort of the hero of uh, Appalachia. He's the tall guy in the middle there. We're with uh, uh, Doug Elliott, uh, who, who uh, has a farm where so many kinds of sweet potatoes are grown. Uh, Jim has an orchard near uh, Sable Community in uh, uh, about an hour from Boone back in there the mountains where he 
grows about uh, 75 kinds of fruit trees and has a field school for students that allowed them to work here that he did with Virginia Nazare and Bob Rhodes on the Southern Seed Legacy. And, and now, because they've worked at this so long and gotten these out to many more people, uh, restaurateurs all over the Southeast are putting these on the menu. And uh, Steve Brock, I mean, uh, Sean Brock is doing this uh, in Charleston using a whole synthesis of what the, the really, truly authentic um, uh, low country cuisine in the Southeast was like with its African and Caribbean influences. And Sean, as a chef, has taken his sous chefs and assistant chefs back to West Africa to see how okra and Carolina gold rice and other things like that that originally came from West Af Africa were originally grown in the home country of people who were enslaved, taken from their homeland, and somehow took seeds with them in their pockets or little bags when they were slaves and brought them over here. So there's a whole colonial imperialistic history involved in some of these crops that have still survived. But Sean and others are trying to daylight and value that, those contributions to American cuisines that black, black slaves themselves made. I don't know if you know the story about pecans, but it's, it's sort of a whopper. There were no cultivated pecans until about the 1840s, 1850s, and uh, some French explorers across the southeast saw the pecans and they said, well, why can't we grow those in Europe like we do walnuts and other things? So they brought a, 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 a plantation owner in the south brought a French horticulturalist to try to graft the biggest and best pecans on the a hardy rootstock and take them back to French, and he, um, the plantation owner uh, offered the skills of a, of a black slave on the plantation to help him crawl up trees, get the pecans, scale down, and then the, the slave would watch this French guy try to use a pocket knife to make grafts. And every one of the French guy's grafts failed. And the plantation owner sent him packing back to French with, uh, France with no pecans because his grafts didn't work. This guy, I'm told, the slave then got out his pocket knife, climbed the same trees, took the rootstock that, that the cuttings from the French guy failed on, and created the first cultivated varieties of pecans, many of which are still grown in the United States. So we're indebted for every pecan we eat to a guy who was enslaved and then recognized for his incredible skills and talents, and he's the founder of the American pecan industry. So there are stories like that embedded in uh, every one of these foods. And indigenous peoples themselves are the leaders in the biocultural reservation of both uh, restoration of both seeds and breeds. Uh, this is a friend of mine. We raised Navajo churro sheep in northern Arizona for 10 years. And I was on the board of the Navajo churro sheep association with this guy. We started uh, learning how to uh, raise a sheep when he was about 14 and by the age 20 he was a commercial producer and on the board with us. Indigenous people from South America and Central America who are refugees, political refugees to this country, have brought some of their seeds with them and are now uh, transitioning from being farm workers to farmers in the Skagit Valley of Washington. And, and other people are working with their new crops like Wapato and Camas for both their medicinal and their culinary value in Washington and Oregon. You, you hear this word heirloom for heirloom vegetables, and it sounds like something that you might see on that really boring TV show that I like click off as soon as it comes on called Antique Roadshow. Like you get an heirloom quill and the guy tells you how much it's worth. They're not static museum pieces. Um, and in fact, some really wonderful plant breeders are taking those things that have now become vulnerable to new pest and diseases that have come in with climate change and breeding resistance into them so they're improved. But instead of patenting them like Monsanto does, what they do is they have an open source seed sharing program with farmers so that when they breed them in collaboration with farmers, 
Farmers get part of the royalties, but no one owns the seed. They get the royalties for the grow out, but no one owns the seed. And, and because it's now in the public domain, no big company can patent them either. So they're, we're not keeping heirloom static because historically traditional farmers didn't do that. They were always selecting them for differences in flavor or, or, uh, or uh, days to maturity or whatever. And that's what we have to do in this time of rapid climate change again. So a lot of these people are taking the long view, like my friend Wes Jackson, who wants the Congress to pass a 50-year farm bill. You know, I mean, now we do a farm, yield, farm bill that barely makes it five years before it's jumped. And some of these indigenous people that I've worked with have always taken that long view because they're, they're farming on lands that their great-grandfathers and great-grandmothers farmed and herded on. And because of the oral history in their communities, they can tangibly see the changes that have happened in their landscape. And Felice Wyndham, who we ate dinner with last night, is doing interviews with elderly women of several cultures to see how they perceive climate change. And that knowledge is as important as what the scientists in our universities and, and government field stations are getting. And their interest in it isn't to just document it for documentation's sake, but try, to try to figure out a way that, that they can bring more resilience into their fields and more inclusive well-being into their communities and to their families so that their kids have a chance to avoid the potential suffering and hardship that climate change will bring on us if we really don't get a grip on it and start adapting to it. So rather than trying to motivate people with the threat of hunger or that the world's going down the, the tubes like hell in the handbasket, we need to tell a new story about restoring diversity from farm to fork. And we see that in our farmers' markets. One in 12 farmers in this country now markets some of their produce locally in farmers' markets. It was a tenth that uh, uh, 25 years ago, even. And so, you know, if you want to talk about homeland security, it's not really about building a 60 foot wall 10 miles south of my home on the US Mexico border. Food, uh, homeland security is food security. If we don't get that right, if we don't take, take, take care of the poorest of the poor and the hungriest in our communities, then our industrial food system is broken and we need something else. And we need you all to be the redesigners of a more just and equitable food system. I love that interplay that's kind of punished echoing of the word restoration and restoring. We need a new story about this. And I think the story that we need to be telling is that five international studies show that of any human activity, small and medium scale farming, has the capacity to not only reduce greenhouse gas emissions and fossil fuel consumption that are driving climate change, but become carbon positive rather than uh, carbon negative uh, on, with these 150 varieties of fruit trees, about 300 fruit trees that I planted on our property, we're, we're now sequestering about 20 tons of carbon per acre and, and uh, our best guess is that we've cooled our local environment off of microhabitat around the orchards by 4 degrees. So this is really needed, this climate adaptation, and any of us can do it. And it's not just me as kind of a uh, uh, over-the-hill professor trying to farm who's doing this. It's happening in some of the, the uh, toughest, most impoverished and challenged communities in the United States. This Mueller Organic Farm is the oldest continuously owned black farm in the in the south. It's in a little town that you may have heard of called Ferguson, Missouri. How many of you have heard of Ferguson? Well, instead of being this hellhole, uh, black and white neighbors come together at Mueller Farm for potlucks, exercise classes, uh, celebrations, uh, youth gardening programs, uh, meals for the elderly. 
And during the war that was going on in Ferguson, these people hung together across racial lines, across cultural lines, and Mueller Organic Farm was the heart where that happened. And, well, again, we talk about heritage foods and all of that. It's not merely about the past. It's fostering innovation. If, if you haven't already got it from your interest in music or dance or other things, tradition and, and innovation are two sides of the same coin. We really can't have the kind of innovation that we've seen in jazz or hip-hop without a good grounding in our traditions. Hip-hop may seem entirely new, but uh, man, you go back to, to some of the, uh, the jazz guys in the 40s and 50s, and they're basically doing it. And it emerges, new innovations emerge out of deeply knowing our traditions. And so when I planted these varieties of fruit trees on our place that I just talked about, we're drawing upon the earliest varieties of fruit trees that got in the southwest that were from northern Africa and Spain. But we're now growing them in permaculture settings where we're stacking multiple functions. We have four or five layers of food producing plants produced under the canopies of these fruit trees. We're also trying to do the various obvious things of uh, reducing food waste. We're taking uh, the 40 percent of our food that now ends up in landfills, I mean, think about that, that if we just took care of food waste, we could feed the world. You know, we wouldn't have to switch to GMOs to feed the world. We just got to take care of the wastefulness in our food system. And so, uh, I'm not going to show it to you today, I don't think it's an eight-minute video. If we have time, we could do it, I suppose. But we had an award-winning thing at the Sundance Film Festi Festival called uh, Man in the Maze. It's on Vimeo, you can get it for free. And it shows how our community uh, that's right on the border, one of the, the busiest ports of entry for food, for produce, winter produce in the, in the country, in the world, how on a single day, 120,000 pounds of tomatoes may get dumped in the landfill because no one will buy them because the, uh, uh, the price of tomatoes from Florida cuts them by a half a cent. And so we got one of the, the landfills with the most produce dumped in it and uh, the highest greenhouse gas emissions of any landfill in the country. We set to work on it and two food banks in that area are now rescuing hundreds of thousands of pounds of food in winter months and sending it to food banks all across the country. They each have trucks that stop in 20 to 30 uh, parking lots, big semi-trucks uh, uh, full of vegetables. And rather than uh, putting people on the food relief line, they ask for $10 donations for 50 pounds of tomatoes, onions, peppers, eggplants, and other things. And hundreds of people show up in each of these uh, parking lots at a, a faith-based community. People get their vegetables, go home, make salsas or, or uh, tomato sauces for spaghetti, sell them to their neighbors, whatever, keep some for their own. The truck goes on to 25 more communities the same day. And tens of thousands of uh, food that would otherwise be wasted are in, in the hands of the poor. We're getting it with dignity. They pay something for it. They feel proud of it, but they're not in the relief line. And then we've started a compost operation. Uh, through bringing some really interesting people in from the Northwest that are using effective microbes to rapidly produce compost. And some Arizona State University students uh, just successfully proof tested a, a, a liquid nutrient solution with effective microbes that I'm now putting on all my fruit trees. It's the highest uh, so, uh, fertilizer or soil amendment in the world in and microbial diversity. So, uh, I've got talking and you've gotten a little bit of meat belatedly, about 10 minutes late, but what do I want out of you? Um, I'm selfish about coming to campuses. I want something out of you or I wouldn't come. What I want out of you is that all of you think of whatever you do the rest of your life, whatever profession you go in, that you're a per peripheral visionary. 
In other words, what that means is instead of looking out with blinkers on just what mainstream America is doing, look at all the weird shit happening on the fringes of our society, because that's where innovation happens. It doesn't come from mainstream agriculture. It isn't what you see on TV. It's all the incredible people who think out of the box, like many of our farmers do, like a baker I was just talking about a few blocks away, an independent baking company, Tom Leonard did. He, he started putting together uh, matchmaking between uh, sustainable grain growers and artisanal bakers in 1973, and now this thing is all over the country. In 1973, they thought they'd ought to put him in the loony bin because they didn't see how anyone would want to go back to turkey red wheat that had been grown in this country as a big grain crop in the north till about 1910, and then people dropped it. They didn't think bakers needed another kind of uh, grain. Go over to that bakery and look at the quality of that stuff. And, and Tom has not only run two bakeries around campuses in the US, but he's trained a hundred other bakers to do that in other countries. He never got into the box, so he didn't have to step outside the box. He was always outside the box. And some of you probably have that inclination, and I just want to encourage you to have the courage to do something with that, because you can all make an impact just as much as he has. It may mean shifting our diets some, and our crop mixes in our fields. So we can't grow apples anymore in most of southern Arizona, but we're growing a hell of a lot of prickly pear, and they use half the water to produce the same amount of food that an apple tree does. Um, uh, do I like prickly pears as much as apples? Now I do. It takes a few years to get used to it because they're gooey like okra are. But that gooeyness in the, in the okra and the prickly pear is what reduces blood sugar to diabetics. A third of our population in southern Arizona has diabetes. Do we need more prickly pear and less apples? Probably. And so these foods are helping take care of major health problems. Um, about 30 years ago, um, we wrote a paper in a book that Wes Jackson and Wendell Berry edited called Meeting the Expectations of the Land, How to Have a Place-Based Agriculture in Each Region of the Country. And we proposed seven, I mean, eight different candidate crops from wild desert plants and old heirlooms that had fallen out of our economy a century before. And we said, these have the drought resistance, water, uh, conservation, capacity, heat tolerance, disease tolerance, and the foods are nutritious for our people. Why don't we bring them back as crops and do them in perennial polycultures in the desert like Wes has done in Paul Grass Prairie? We were laughed out of the room at most land-grant colleges in the Southwest saying, no one's ever going to grow mesquite trees as a crop. We're trying to uh, uh, wipe it out with herbicides off the rangelands here. You guys you guys ought to be put in a sanatorium for even thinking about this. Now, seven out of eight of those are in restaurants and farmers markets, microbreweries, and diabetes health clinics, and hospitals and school cafeterias every day of the year. And, and uh, the one that isn't is because the guy who was really working on it died at age 40 and all of us were in such grief that his work couldn't be pieced back together that that's the only one that hasn't made it through. So these are things that people thought were impossible 35 years ago and now they're everyday parts of our food system. That means rebuilding food supply chains. Um, and that little chart is one that we drew when we first started to revive uh, heritage grain that I saved the last seed from the North America up in about 1978, a coffee can full of seeds of what had been the, the most important grain in Arizona from 1716 to uh, 1950, and I got the last bunch of seeds. That was about 15 people involved in that food supply chain. Now there's over 150, and it's in Whole Foods, 12 farmers markets, 10 microbreweries, and probably five dozen bakeries in our state. So that's what we get from working together. There's no single hero for that. The community is the hero. 
same thing's happening you know, with animals, just so you make make it clear that I'm, I'm a plant geek, but I do occasionally pay attention to animals. I've been participating with the International uh, the Intertribal Bison Council and, uh, and other bison growers, and now, since 2003, the amount of grass-fed American bison for, for buffalo burgers has increased fourfold, and this is much more healthful to us than feedlot beef. And this is really happening on a scale that was unimaginable 20 years ago. And now we're trying to experiment with things to reduce the heat stress both on our crops and the farm workers with accelerating climate change. We've had a 20 fold increase in the amount of heat stroke and heat exhaustion among farm workers in Arizona and California. 14 to 18 year old women from Mexico, that's 80% of our workforce, by the way. Uh, Mexican born people, and a lot of them are women, not men. Some of them pregnant, some of them that have never been in a desert climate are picking most of the produce you and I eat. And they're suffering from heat stroke and heat exhaustion because they're working 8 to 12 hours out in 110 to 116 degree heat. And so now we're trying to put uh, high strut photovoltaic arrays over crops that need multiple cuttings during the heat of the summer. And that reduces the heat stress on the crops and increases their yield. And it also is a, is a farm worker welfare uh, strategy to reduce the heat stress on the workers themselves. So we have that at Biosphere 2 and two schools in our country and our city now to field test them. So the bottom line for me is that all of us need to be involved in redesigning a food system that takes care of three things. Human health, land health, and inclusive economic well-being for our communities. And if we don't redesign these food systems to take care of the poorest of the poor, the hungriest people who've been marginalized by our industrial food system, then what we've done has been a failure. Until we achieve that goal, we can't say that anything in local, sustainable, organic agriculture has really been successful. And I'll stop there. Thank you.